All right, Doug, I wanted to see the Speedway from a totally different vantage point. So I figured the thing to do is to take a lap with the president of the Speedway, that, right? That works, and okay. the good news is we get to take a lap at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. <laughs> Anytime true. we can get a car on that track is true. here is a, a good day. I don't even have to be riding with you for it to be cool, right? No, that's the truth, man. It, it just, does just, be, help, just being here is, uh, as you know, it's a pretty special place. So what changes have taken place that people are going to see? I mean, obviously there were fans here a year ago, but I want you to show me over the course of it some of the different things that we're going to see that we didn't see maybe a year or two ago. Well, we'll start out on track. We can point some stuff out on track, and then we'll, uh, we'll maybe drive off track, see what we find. All right, sounds good. Let's go. Do you remember, you know, because I do for me, do you remember the very first time you came here? The first time you saw this facility? Yeah, so I would have been in um, you know, second or third grade. We lived over off of 42nd and Kessler, so you could hear the cars. And we came over for a practice day, and, it, and I'd written a note to A.J. Foyt, <laughs> um, and we stood on the behind the pits and that's back in the day when the fence was really low i was yeah. small enough i could barely see over but it would have come up to you know our waist or a little maybe a little higher um and hand in the my note to some crew member as they were rolling the car back back in the garage area and the crew member throwing it in the seat so that's sort of my first first big memory of the speedway i sat right here the first time i came to the race i sat in the paddock but then my dad and i starting in 83 sat right here and turned two in the southeast vista every year and it's so funny, Doug, I, I know you know this, but you know, you can't go around here without seeing different places that, at least for me, right. that remind me of like different family members that aren't here anymore 100%. and what this place meant to them. And you know, my grandfather climbing a tree to try to look yep. in, all those yep. stories, right? I mean. Well, that's, so I'll call 10 customers every night on my way home and I'll end up talking to, you know, two or three, depending on who answers the phone. And that's the fun part of asking somebody, you know, what, how'd you get introduced? How'd you fall in love right. with the Speedway? And they all have that story. And everybody that's come for a long time, you do have those family members and friends and, you know, even just people that you, you met and sort of became family because they sat in the same place right. you do. And those folks that are gone, you still think about them all the time, right? Uh, I mean, it's just one of those things you, you definitely think about. You know, it's, for me, and everybody has their moment, right? Yep. And I, I realized that, you know, the playing of taps is to remember those who gave the ultimate sacrifice since Memorial Day weekend. Yep. But I always think about my Aunt Dottie and my Uncle Walt, my grandparents, because, yeah. you know, I mean, this place, they grew up on the west side. You know, I think about how in that moment I always think, like, okay, you know, they're, they're here watching the race, waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, but, you know, it's just such a, for you, I can't imagine. I mean, is there ever a day when you're leaving work where you don't almost pitch yourself? Oh, that's every day, right? I mean, coming in for sure every day, the fact that I get to work here and then going home, you know, oftentimes going home at night when no one else is here and you walk out in the parking lot and you go, I'm on the backside of turn one in the history of the place. It's it's definitely one of those moments where, you know, you don't take it for granted that I'm, I, I think I'm the 11th president in the history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And most of them were either founders, so Fisher and Allison, right. or bought the Speedway, Rick and Bacher, or... Holman, and then with the exception of you know Shaw and you know, Joy Chipwood and Jeff and John Cooper, there are a hand of, handful of folks in between there. But uh, so the license plate on this car is 11, which is kind of cool, That's right? I mean, cool, it just so um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's definitely a pinch me moment. You get a day. hat with an 11 on the there side. You go, get a, yeah, yeah, the whole deal. But this is a pinch me moment. It just getting you and I getting to get out here and drive around this place, and and especially for folks like us. The place is amazing, but then you start thinking, we're going over the yard of bricks right here, and since, you know, really 1910, right, when the bricks were first in, but 1911 for sure, when Ray Haroon wins the first Indianapolis 500, the, the, the layout, the width, the banking, none of it's changed. We're, we're on top of most of those 3.2 million bricks that were put in in the fall of 1909 are under us right now, and that's what gets me, just the history, the men and women who've tried to compete here, paid the sacrifice, and, you know, and, talking earlier about drivers who lost their lives here I mean because they wanted to win at this place nine degrees 12 minutes is the banking yep and 
you know, when you're driving it, you kind of, you really can't feel it. I, I'm not going to say that it pulls you through, but you can feel it. But you know what's interesting is when you drove over the bricks, you know, we can feel it right now when we're doing, yep. you know, what, 55, 55 miles an hour. Yeah. So can you imagine it? 240. It's it's funny. So after every test that we have here, I'll call the drivers that have been in the test, ask them, hey, is the track changed? What's different? What's new? Um, and like there's a bump we're going to go over right now coming off the exit two that you feel really right there pretty significantly yep. in the car. They don't notice. It's crazy. Really? What, yeah, it's because they're so fast and they're getting over, over them. So you would think they the would are so low. I know. It's really, it's really weird. So we just went across one back there and that, that one right there that you just sort of felt that I called a few years ago after the test in Dixon was saying, hey, you know, there must be a timing line or something there. It's a problem. So we went out and took a look at it, and we did a core sample. And the core sample came out, and on, on either side of it was a little sliver of brick, and then there was six inches of asphalt in the middle. And I called Donald Davis. I said, what do you think? He goes, oh, yeah, in the 30s, the bricks would buckle because of the, the freeze and thaw, and then they just take a row out of, of bricks out and put asphalt in them. So, that, so that, that issue from the 30s was raising its head in a fall, like 2017 or 2018 test with Dixon. Really? Which is really, right? That's the history of the place that just even today, almost 100 years so later. So how many that, different surfaces are underneath this? I mean, obviously the bricks, Well, it's, right? it's different depending on where we where we are. Or, see, the corners have been paved more than the, than the straights. Um, and then oftentimes when we go in and repave, we mill down a bunch of it and take some off. So it just depends on where you, where we are. But so going right through here, there's probably, there's bricks and then five or six layers of asphalt to okay. where we are now. Now, 3.2 million bricks laid originally, right? Yep. yep. And then obviously as they dug the tunnels, bricks would come out. Yep. And then ultimately, you know, it used to be the straightaway was unpaved and then now just the one yard of bricks is unpaved. How many original bricks are out there that are no longer here, like out in the wild. And I don't no know. Longer. I mean, there's a lot of them. Um, you know, people that have that have the bricks. But right now, we're, we just don't have any a whole lot around right now. So if people have them, they're more valuable now than maybe they'll be in a couple of years when we resurface. So that bump that we went over in turn two, that I just that I just mentioned, um, that's an area that we're probably going to have to excavate all the bricks that are under there because that's causing the problem. The freeze and thaw and the water going underneath it is actually raising itself uh, or manifesting itself. And then you build yourself a little shed in your backyard with that. Yeah, well, I don't. It'd be awesome, right? Or a walkway into the front door. Um, what things are different in terms, you know, when's the last time that, like, the pavement we're going over was last laid or grooved when? 2004. Okay. So it was the last so time we so, it? so we're close. Uh, the teams don't want to do it. We don't want to do it. So what we've been doing the last few years is putting that something called an RPE. So it's not the PJ1 that the NASCAR guys don't, you know, that everybody's uh, complaints about. But it's a penetrant that actually goes into the surface of the track and, and will um, fill up the holes inside it. Last year was the first year that we started seeing significant weepers, especially in turn two again. And that's a lot because the, the asphalt's just getting old underneath and you can't see it well, but there's little lines here where we've actually done the hand sealing of the crack where in between the layers of asphalt. So it's beginning to move. Um, you so, know, hopefully so weepers, we get a year or two. weepers is when water from underneath comes It's water that's right? frozen and then as the thaw comes, it's trying to figure its way out of the racetrack and it's typically early in the spring and hopefully by the time you get to the race day that they're still not around but we'll, it'll be interesting to see how this how this play out this year do you bring in you know we, we know that this is a speedway where the best drivers in the world come here to compete is that true also of, of the engineers and the people that you bring in to to flatten it out to, to seal it to do all of those things so that's the group we've worked with forever for our, our not forever but for the last 25 or 30 years on asphalt's a group called heritage and a, and a company that they own called Milestone. They're Indianapolis based, but they have engineers uh, that are focused specifically on what's the right asphalt mix and then what do things look like. So in uh, 2020, uh, the first practice day in 2020, we ended up having a, uh, a piece of the racetrack come up in turn two. So where the old rumble strips used to be for NASCAR and to the asphalt, the asphalt at the edge was starting to come up. So I called him, uh, the main guy who does most of our work was in Illinois, drove over until three o'clock in the morning. We were all out, just literally on our hands and knees, hand pounding asphalt, a special mix of asphalt in to keep in. It's been fine ever since 2020. That's like Carl Fisher, it, it's, 19, it's, 1910 out there, it's right? It's crazy, like, right? I mean, yeah. we're all out there with, on our, and, and they heat it up, they put a special mix in, you put then, then you are like sealing in, and then you put the special asphalt in, and then you're just hammering it down. And we were rotating because 
it doesn't seem like it, but you got these big, huge, heavy mallets, and so you just, you just get worn out. And so then you would you would just kind of rotate through people and heat it up, and it was literally till three o'clock in the morning trying to get it done. So the last thing I really want to be doing, unlike the NASCAR curve, which we can go take a look at again in a minute, we got right. a new one there, which is great. The last thing you want to be doing is doing that kind of work while people are sitting in the grandstands. Right. You want to get it done because we talked about well, maybe we'll just take a look at it in the morning. I was like, no, we're, we'll stay up all night if we have to. I want when the green flag drops. I want to go race, and I don't want to be waiting on us to fix racetrack. When you go around here, because I do, it's time. Each spot, I want you to tell me what, like, a race memory you have from from that spot in the track. Because I do that a lot, right? Yep. I look at it, and I'm like, okay, you know, here's where, like, right here, you know, here's where. Yep. Lion Dyke, Mansell, and Fittipaldi yep. going into the turn, or, or Mears and, and yeah. Michael. Well, you you just touched on one as we go into turn one, right? The the, the Mears and. Michael battle, or frankly, the Sato, um, yeah, Sato, Dario. Sato Dario battle going into turn one is such a, uh, a big moment, I think, that you think of here. And then uh, there's, a, there's an obvious one as you exit turn one and you go through the short shoot and you think about Danny Sullivan. And Don't Mario do Dario, it. Right? Don't it's do it, like, yeah, right? it's just Don't like, spin a win here. Right here, this is, this is that, that, you know, maybe one of the most iconic moments in our Indy 500 history is as uh, right Danny here. spinning right here. And then the other one that you think of here is Scott Dixon flying through the air. Um, and hitting the fence right, right, right there, and then and then Elio actually kind of sort of launching himself there, trying to avoid it. And you get to turn two, and you think of uh, one of my heroes, Roberto Guerrero's pre 500 m miss, and then of course the turn two sweeps. You think of Elton Rasmus and then Tom Sneva, right? So, I mean, those are just that corner alone, and, and that's just you think about when those people I call and who started coming to 500 in the 50s, they're going to have a little, maybe different memories right, right. than you and I would, but but that's sort of that front stretch, I mean, that's kind of what I think of there. You know, back stretch is probably the pass that kept Elio from picking up his fourth yeah, win Hunter earlier, Ray. right? As Hunter Ray's doing one of these deals, right? He's going to go right down in the grass. I mean, Elio's like right here, and Hunter Ray says, okay, screw you. I'm going right into the grass. So, I mean, that's a pretty, a pretty. Does that irritate you when, when they go in the grass and it screws the grass up? <laughs> I would think so, right? No, I'm really weird. The only thing that irritates me is when somebody does a uh, burnout on the yard of bricks. Yeah. I mean, that that's the thing that well, irritates me. Well, I don't think me. that makes you weird. I think it makes you... you no, I, but, but I guess that's true. I guess that's true. All right, so so we go into turn three, and you probably think about Al and... Mo and the Mo and, 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 and... They touch and, wheels. And just that that piece of it through three uh, and four, I think. You know, this is where Pagano made a pass, too. That's true. A hundred percent. There's been a lot, right? A hundred percent. And I go through this corner a lot, and you think about people... Uh, like Gordon Smiley and, and Tony Renna and people that we lost on this end of the racetrack that, that you know, in the, in the sport. But you know, Doug, it's interesting to me is going into four. I mean, poor J.R. Hildebrand probably drives past us and thinks about it every time, right? Yeah. Um, but the flip side of that, Sam Lawrence Jr. is in Lawrence, second right yeah, you're here. You're right. right? He's you're in right. second, and he's going to come on and win the Indy 500. Scott Goodyear right about here decides yep. he's going to make his move. Rick Mears against Gordon Johncock. Yep. maybe should have made it on the first take but you know when you think about because i do as well i mean i think about gordon smiley when you go into three and you think about Joby marcello yep you know those that have passed and i know that sounds weird but there's a there's an element i realized naturally of like a macabre with that and people would think that but i almost think it's like a tribute to them to remember them not necessarily in the fact that they passed but and the fact that they would be the first to say that it's because they put everything on the line to make this race or to try to win this race. And that's what makes it so unique. Yep. You well, we, and we sort of talked about that at the beginning, right? All of the seven, almost 800 drivers who competed, just think of all the ones that didn't make it, but they all, that's, it's um, Eddie Sachs. You know, I yeah. think of Indianapolis 500 every day, of the, every day of the week and even in my sleep, you know, that kind of thing. And, and Another, you know, obviously another guy lost his life here, but those guys, they put everything on the line to win at this race, or to make it, first of all, and then to, and then to win at the racetrack. So you're right. I mean, it, it, it's uh, it's like, why does it, why does somebody climb a mountain? Because it's there, and, you, and a lot of people think that's crazy. It's sort of like, why would a race car driver put himself in, in through that? But you have to understand this place to understand. You're right. You it's know, more respect than anything when you think about this I think the thing, race. to me, you tell me if this makes sense, you would naturally think that if it's a place where people have passed, then, then, then there are people who would say, well, do you think it's haunted? And I would say, it's not haunted because anybody who passed here had love for it. Yeah. So they wouldn't come back to haunt it because they love it. 
they might be hanging around to see what's going on. Yeah. But they're not. They don't want to make life miserable for anybody, here, right? Because yeah. they got love for it. It's funny you say that. So you can walk around this place at night in the dark uh, oh, by man. yourself, and you start thinking about those stories. Yeah, yeah. And you can convince yourself that you're hearing stuff, and, and it, the place is. I mean, people who come to the Indy 500 get it. It's alive on race day. Oh, right. But this place is alive when there's no one here. And I, it's just there's just something really special about this place. But you can absolutely convince yourself. I want to go down pit lane here because of this guy. But no, you can absolutely convince yourself that there's spirits around here. You know, my favorite, my favorite time of the month of May, each day is at the end of practice, after most people have left, I know you know this, but about 6.30 or so after you've been in the media center and get done doing what we're doing and the track's quiet, and every time I drive underneath the, the north tunnel or I, I leave, the sun, you know, it's, it's a little more calm, and I look out at the track and I think about everything that took place that day, yep. like the roar of it, and then it's just quiet again. Yep. There's there's really kind of almost like a peaceful feeling to it, you know? There's definitely that. So another thought I had just going through right there, Pat Bedard. Yeah. Right? I mean, just right the, the, here, the right? thing you just think about that, that um, there's just so many memories and iconic moments of, yeah, flipping that car down. Well, then, what's funny is like, so right now we're going 40 and it feels like we're going at a pretty decent speed. But you watch the race and they come down pit road and then, you know, the, the pit road speed limit's 160. Yeah. And it looks like they're just crawling. crawling. Yep. Then you get out here and you're like, man, they're, you're moving. Yep. Now you're not Gordon, you know, you're not Gordon John Hock 82 pit stop past, but you're, but you're moving. But so much was made last year. Was it last year when the curbing? Yep. We'll go back. We'll go up and take a look. Yes, for sure. We got that weekend coming back up on the road course. How much did, you know, just in the overall prestige of the venue, and I think a lot of people, traditionalists, think when they think about the road course, well, you know, it's it should just be the, the oval. But the yep. road course was envisioned all the way back in the beginning, right? It was envisioned back in the beginning. I think uh, Carl thought he was going to end up doing that and ultimately didn't. So, it, you know, it took us 100 years almost to get the road course in there. And, and uh, you know, I get it. I mean, I understand how people, especially people who grew up when the only, you know, fell in love with this place, when the only time it was used during the year was the month of May and every time, you know, it was closed down the rest of the year. It's, it's it, as a traditionalist like that, it's, we're going to, in fact, go back the other direction. Um, you know, I get why people have have a struggle with it and I get why people struggled when NASCAR came um, but the road course is an FIA grade one road course it is as good a road course um, certainly it's the best road course in any oval because it's a proper road course but I, I would argue it's as good as a lot of just purpose-built road courses around here and, and uh, NASCAR has put on a good show and we've had those same curbs down here since we started running Indy cars on this in, in 2014 and we really have never had had an issue um, didn't have an issue that entire weekend honestly and then all of a sudden we uh we had an issue on, on race day and the curb came up so we've been really trying to think about what exactly do we want to do to to uh do you hold your breath at the beginning of each race like i think we've got everything buttoned down but you never know you you absolutely there is that concern all along even the 500 right you just don't know what you don't know and the place is a huge place and we do a ton of maintenance and preventative maintenance but you just never know what might go wrong um so for sure, and we and I kind of got the sense we may be in trouble with that curb when we had that first the first stage break in the NASCAR race last year when when somebody's splitter had already gone under there and in order to get it out they had to pry the they had to pry the curb up a little bit which made the gap even bigger and then as, and those NASCAR uh, Cup cars are right on the ground so then they just started lifting it up as time as so time, that's the thing is it kind on. of the is it the weight of the car going over it that almost kind of suction pulls it up. I know that sounds weird. What was happening with that is geometry the, what, no, what was happening with that is the splitter was actually getting underneath the get, getting underneath the curb and 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 pulling it up. Gotcha. Okay. So that was a uh, that was what caused it, and then uh, it just kept getting more and more and more. So then it just and then you get the whole the whole splitter and more of the car, and then on that rest, that last rest, restart when the mess really happened. Um, you know, everybody was spreading out, and they didn't they didn't even care that there was a curve there, right? So they, so they went across it in a way that even in practice and qualifying, they never they never used it so that way. So I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble here, but was that curbing laid down by you guys or by NASCAR? No, no, it's our, it was it was our curb. Okay. I mean, like I said, it had been there, and it, it had been fine all the way through 2014. Uh, we'd never had an issue with it. So that's the first time we'd had a problem. Uh, so what we've done is we actually came through here, and we, we uh, cut out the... 
we cut out the asphalt and we put a permanent, you know, you'll see this is, this will be a fun one to drive across. We put a permanent, um, <laughs> we put a permanent concrete curb. If so I didn't have to use a restroom before that, I do now, right? <laughs> so it's not, it's, it's, it's not dissimilar to like what we've got in some, I'll show you like eight and nine there. It's just a little, the peak to the valley is a look is about an inch bigger. So that way, I mean, you don't want to get on it. It's not going to come up. It's, it shouldn't launch you. So, um, but like even that, so this curb as we're coming up to turn seven here is a temporary curb that we've, that we bolt down on the racetrack, just like the chicane curb was that we've had in here since 2014, no issues. Um, it was just the way the cars hit it and, and the way those cars, you know, ended up on the ground. But this is just a really gentle, you guys can get up and over that. And, and they do that every they time, They do that right? every time, no problems. And then, and then this corner I call Will Power Corner because we had to make the curb wider because Will would put both sides of the car across it so you'd have his left his left in the in the grass and his right on the asphalt so that's not quite as aggressive as you, you can tell as the the other ones are so if you had to test out a track because different drivers see different lines when yep. they go through right yep. so when you have drivers come out to test it do you intentionally get drivers that seemingly have different field of vision in the way that they drive so that you have all bases covered? So when we built this current version of the road course, um, I leaned, and leaned really heavily on Scott Dixon and Tony Kanaan. Both have a little separate driving styles, but both also understood what we were trying to do. So even in the construction of the racetrack, we did. And then on this curb up here, we've had several drivers come out and take a look at it. We actually had um, Connor Daly come out and run. Uh, Rogers built a really cool little uh, a two-seat Xfinity car, um, so as people can ride along. So we had and so we had Connor out doing laps and moving. We we first started with cones and said, okay, what if we put the curb here? What if we put it here? What's that do to the speed of turn seven? Is it going to be too heavy of a braking zone? You know, all the different things. Does is it is it flat through those chicane or does it create some? Does the driver have to have some sort of skill to get through it? And then we ultimately settled on putting it back where it was, but putting it in this way. And then, uh, and then we had Andy Light's test on it to make sure everything's okay. And, and we'll probably get, we'll probably get uh, Connor back out here again in that, in that Xfinity car just to run through it. But is it hard to come up with something that appeases every series? Oh, you can't, it's yeah. not possible, right? The most important thing for us though, is when you put it in this, is that you want to be, we want to still be one of the two tracks in the U S permanent tracks in the U S that are FIA grade one. And so we had to work with the FIA and, and ACUS and, and Tony Kopman um, here in the U.S. to make sure that this curb fits FIA Grade One standards, so that if F1 ever decided to come here, we essentially know our track's ready for it. That's not going to happen. I'd love for it to. Roger would love for it to. So um, it just economics, and it'll be interesting to see how they end up with their th uh, three dates in the U.S. So one of the other new things, that building right there, is the. Uh, the performance center and that'll be used by BMW for school days about 30 days a year and then we'll use it for special events throughout the rest of the rest of the year so the old carousel we took the one down in between the in, carousel meaning that the yeah the, the old top pop, scoring the thing, thing the, yeah right? that was there we had one on the south end we took down several years ago and then the one that was up here was built Always in listed the top eight wasn't it? top ten was the top ten yeah, top 10? ten would go up there and and then the miles per hour average and then um, the lap number and so that that came down we it's something I know our fans. Is there a video board out here? Yeah, there's a, there's a video board. I call right there. turn three, Doug. I need that video board. You know that, right? Yeah, yeah. It's still gonna be there, right? It's gonna be there. Okay, the video board's there. We're my cheat we're sheet. Going to, speaking of turn, there's all this. You're gonna go take out, take, check out some of the platforms, right? Um, yeah. So, so we're excited about that. It'll be a really cool space. It'll be a fun space to be on the roof of that thing and watch a car day concert. Um, so that that you know that that'll be fun. So that's that's Is that platform up there new. We have cleaned a lot of the platforms up, so we've taken a lot, taken um, a lot of them clean up. And that one is relatively new. It was put up there for television. Uh, they wanted a different spot, and I think it was actually ABC uh, days, uh, but the very end of the ABC relationship. The turn four broadcast bench is still there. Yep. Has OSHA been out there lately? Did check that out. I'm worried about it in three. I uh, yeah. Well, you know that's. Um, hopefully they uh, understand that it's relatively safe <laughs> you guys sign the waivers and you, you're all good right I, I think so so a lot of the work I'm we've heavier done, than last year a lot of the so work we've done this year so the front stretch here the tower terrace we did we cleaned up all the steel underneath the tower terrace so as people come out this year and they get under that it's it's not something that you, you know you're going to notice right away but it's but if you look up you'll realize that we've spent a whole ton of money and time getting all that steel cleaned up and refurbished and uh, look it looks really good underneath there for those for those suites 
Uh, we've got a lot of work that we've done in the infield care center this year, so completely new wrapping around the outside for insulation, uh, and then cleaning up the inside and making that better. And that's a cool place because obviously it takes care of drivers. Uh, but the other thing that it does is uh, uh, if you're sick here at the Speedway or you need something, you can go in the infield care center or any of our uh, satellite locations around. 15 and, different, right? 15 absolutely. first aid stations. And it costs you nothing. You don't charge you anything. Only time you get charged or your insurance gets charged is if there's something big wrong with you and we discharge you and send you to a hospital. Okay. So if you're not feeling good on race day at the Indy 500, we want to make sure you, you get taken care of. Just go, go see one of our docs and, and they'll be happy to happy to take care of you. It's a, it's a pretty cool relationship we have with IU Health, formerly Methodist, uh, has been a partner of ours since the, the day that the gates were opened. How much, I mean look, it's the elephant in the room, but unfortunately this year I think, you know, it feels like we're finally out from underneath it. And I know certainly from a limitation standpoint we are, but how much did you have to lean on them the last two years just with the pandemic and figuring out, and it was changing every couple of weeks, right? right? I mean, it was constant. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're a great partner. We spent an awful lot of time talking to them about, you know, things we could do. They kept us updated on, you know, some, you know, some of the numbers that were public numbers, but they really kind of helped us um, really go through the data and understand it. And, uh, you know, the other, the other organization that was super helpful for us was, uh, uh, was AMR, GMR. They were fantastic in terms of Dr. Rock and the folks really helping us figure out how to safely have an Indy 500 last year. Uh, so that was got two really good partners in that, in that sense. So I know this, right next to the Infield Care Center is kind of the helipad, if yep. you will. Yep. I think 1979 is when they first started using it to transport, I mean like literally lifeline for drivers. Right. So will they actually take, if somebody is critical enough, will they put them in a helicopter and take them from here to Methodist? Now it depends on the timing. Generally what will happen is, so that like we were just talking about there's the, the Exteriors all new this year. We're excited about it. It's, it should be good. No, so what would happen? It, the, the helicopter really is here in the event that something happens at the end of the race when the traffic is so bad you can't gotcha. get somebody somewhere. Okay. So if you've got an issue on on track, you're, we're better off to put them in an ambulance and take them the four miles downtown to the end versus get them out of the get the helicopter fired up, get them out, get them in a helicopter, fly them down there. You're going to get there quicker. Right. Where you really would need the that you would need the helicopter is it you know the last something happens the last 10 laps of the race and by the time you you know you get out the traffic is gridlocked so that's what the helicopter really is there for. how many you know working with impd just the traffic the crowd control how many impd officers do you guys get or how many does impd dispatch or is it up to you guys to help out with that in terms of the traffic control yeah so so we have a great relationship i'm gonna take us back out the front range. we have a great relationship with all all local and state law enforcement and it really starts in December and then you know through the spring almost every week uh, the law enforcement committee gets together and it includes the state police, Mary County Sheriff, IMPD, Speedway Police, federal authorities, a whole bunch of others and they start thinking about okay what do we need to do where where are our pain points who, who gets there and so we really rely on law enforcement professionals to tell us exactly what right. they think. It's are. amazing though. I mean, to have that many people in one area. Oh yeah. It's, and I mean, you just have to know and accept is that when you leave, you're going to go whatever area they tell you to go. Right. Until you get a couple blocks out and then it's up to you to kind of turn around yep. and head back. You yep. know what I mean? But just get out of the nucleus is, is the important thing. And that's exactly it. And then we've got, you know, the, all of them are in a room together talking about what's going on. So if you're coming in on race day and there's a, there's a crash at 38th and and girls school they'll divert traffic and they can make sure that they're communicating with everybody to figure out how that you know how that works so it's it's good to have them I mean, you get 300 plus thousand people in one location especially trying to leave at the same time is it's always you're always gonna have traffic we're never gonna be able to solve it but so the performance center come along really well it's gonna have some new parking now this will be open when this will open it'll be open in May well, I think the first day we'll actually try it out is we'll try it out on on the GMR Grand Prix race and day the main thing that it, its main purpose is what so it'll you know, 30 days a year it'll be used by BMW uh, they'll use it at for a, a performance driving school and then the rest of the year we're gonna use it for a hospitality space so like I said gotcha. the, the roof is created now into a hospitality space and so this year um, the snake pit and the car and carb day are gonna be in this location so we're moving carb day over here as well. So the snake pit stage. Is so the snake pit stage and the carb day stage right up there on the gravel. Gotcha. And it'll be playing this way. And so that I can't wait to see what the view is like from the from the roof of that thing. 
it should be uh, should be pretty neat uh, for for carp day. I'll try and avoid it on snake pit day. Okay, all right, here you go. I'm, so I'm over there in one of those baskets, and yep. on race day, every once in a while, some you know smoke or something will go off from the snake pit stage, and I'm kind of freaks me out for a minute, right? Like, oh man, you know, yep. I missed something, and then I realize, oh no, that's the concert's going on. So we're gonna do some resurfacing back here uh, still this year to get ready for uh, for our dirt track race. We've uh, actually gotten um, done some work inside, moving dirt around and trying to trying to get some of the rocks that keep coming up every spring just because of the way the freeze and thaw works. We got a lot of work still to do out here, but uh, I'm still working on trying to get it all prepped. So we've taken the clay out, putting the clay back down, s sifting the clay uh, so that we can get rid it's of some, crazy some of the to rocks. Think that races take place on that track. It's, I know it's, it's tiny. Just a bull ring, right? It's tiny. But it's a per it's the perfect midget track. It is it's been I mean every race we've had there has been outstanding and and Kyle Larson's figured out how to get around that place pretty well. That's, that's a shock, it's right? It's pretty amazing. You know what's cool though? Um, what's cool is you know Kyle Larson as good as he is, he's great. But Brian Clawson would love that track. Uh, well, that's you know, and that's why it's the BC thirty nine, right? It's it's uh, for Brian Clawson, and, and I don't know if you were out here for the day. We put the little fake dirt track in with Tony Stewart, um, and had Brian out here, and and a bunch of guys started talking about putting money up and having a, a race for five thousand bucks, and that you know I, we had like six cars here, right? right. And uh, Tony Stewart had cash in his pocket. He was put, he was handing out, and it was and then Brian Clawson said, "Hey Doug, can you talk a minute?" And we walked off the side. He said, "Don't do this." So what do you mean? He goes, look, we all want to be, the, to be able to say we're the first to win at the Speedway in a midget. He said, but this has been such a great event today. All that can happen now is something bad happened and we'll never get an opportunity to build a track here. Just please don't do this. So I thought, oh my gosh, the race car driver is the adult in the room, which never happens, right? Right, right. And so it was the right decision, although looking back on having lost Brian, it's like, dang it, we should have done it because my guess is Brian wins that thing, right? Right, right. Um, But it's, it's uh, he would, you're right, he would absolutely He'd love this. it. He would have parked it. He would have parked it. So we're uh, we're getting ready. Pretty much covers all the ground, right? Yep. I mean, every time, Doug. Every time I come out here, I think to myself. You know, I think of the the photos of the vision and Carl Fisher getting off the train from downtown, looking out over the farm fields. That vision, and I think. What in the world would he think? You know, it's funny. I think about that a lot, right? And he was a promoter. I think a. I think he'd be surprised that it was still here. Um, but b. I think he'd also take an awful lot of pride in the fact that he created something to help promote Indianapolis, to promote the automobile industry, entertain fans. And it, he called it from the beginning an international sweepstakes, right? It was the greatest race course in the world before it was ever ever had a race on it, right? I mean, all those things that he he wanted it to be sort of turned out to be. I think you'd mostly be thrilled that you kept a lot of the men's bathrooms the same. Right? <laughs> I mean you gotta keep a tradition. Yeah, I don't yeah, I don't know what the bathrooms were like back then. I'm guessing there's a hole in the ground, but uh, <laughs> uh, we'll do one more lap here and I'll take you back. But uh, no a lot of a lot of change. Most of our big change, you know, happened in, in twenty twenty leading into twenty twenty one. So the video boards and restrooms and you know concession stand upgrades in the back of the Long Georgetown Road, that stuff, um, and so really, what we've been focused on this year are things that the fan may not necessarily see, but some deferred maintenance that just hadn't been done over the last several years. That how many gallons of paint? Oh my gosh, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of paint. It just and that's probably never ending, right? It's never ending, and that's the thing. I mean, some of the stuff we've done, we've never painted before because we've always had the philosophy: well, if you start painting, you got to always paint it. Roger said, I don't care if it looks better, then we'll paint it and we'll keep painting it. So, like the top of the walls, I mean, you would you'd know from your perch on uh, in the radio booth it used to just be that old concrete top, top of the wall he didn't like it and he's right it looks better painted but it's just more surface area that you have to paint all the time and, and, and his philosophy is it doesn't matter and i know they're newer but the catch fence is the better catch fence looks and, a lot you know better, strangely right? enough you look at you know like where i am i'm looking through a fence but you don't even you can't even tell like, right you don't even notice it yeah no it's and it's fence made in northern indiana so it's an indiana company is it really it. yeah absolutely so it's part of the fun too. It's just those little. This is sort of like the bricks, right? You know, they have that Indiana connection, and then we got to go a little faster for this yeah, last good. back stretch. Can't, can't just sit here. But yeah, it's a. Uh, it's definitely a cool place. You've done this before, right? Occasionally, 
I'll, I'll occasionally call my wife at the end of the day and say, hey, uh, I'm going to be late. <laughs> near the museum, yes. But so like right now, there at the left, we're going through all the safer foam. So that safer wall foam has a, has a life expectancy just because of all the UV rays that it goes through. So we have to replace all that and it's not an inexpensive task. And then for for NASCAR and IndyCar, you, they're, different, they're different amounts of foam because really? of the weight and the speed of the car. So in between those tests and races, you're always you know swapping stuff out. There's not an inch unchecked is there oh I'm sure there's some stuff that gets away but except for the turn three part yeah yeah but we try and you know, try and keep up it's a, the whole campus is a thousand acres so it's a it's a lot of work I think that last lap was the most fun lap it's always more fun with a little speed behind it but it's pretty cool I appreciate you taking me around well thanks for loving it's one of the better road trips I've been on well thanks for loving this place like you do I mean it's uh, the best it's, it's uh, definitely an amazingly cool, cool place. The guys have all new blinkers on their trucks so that when they're on track, everything lights up, which is pretty cool. I just hope we don't see them driving around trying to dry the place anytime. I know, I know. Sure. One of the things, if we end up having to drive, we got to put you in the sweeper with Woody. Oh, yeah. That's pretty fun. It'd be a good, it'd be be cool. a good, little, be a good little piece for you. Here he is. Doug Bowles, across the yard of bricks. All right. I appreciate the time. Yeah, no problem. I gotta Thanks. go back to work. I know. Well, I'm here. We're <laughs>